Take two. <laughs> Ready? All right. Hey, uh, welcome to uh, my intro to OpenShift at Java 1. Um, if you're here live in attendance, we're going to be giving away a Raspberry Pi at the end of this talk. Uh, so feel free to take a seat, uh, sit down, and interact with this uh, live demo. Um, so we're here in the Java One in the Red Hat booth at Java One. Uh, my name is Ryan J. Uh, you can find me online, um, Ryan J at RedHat.com. I'm also Ryan J on GitHub, IRC, and Twitter. Uh, feel free to follow up with me if you have any questions about OpenShift or uh, any of the cloud-related uh, projects that Red Hat is currently looking into. Um, so here's a quick summary of the stack that I'll be working with and the stack, the kind of future stack that Red Hat has in mind when we're building for the cloud. Uh, so there's a couple core pieces to this model. The first one, uh, we like to start off with uh, Project Atomic. Uh, so Atomic, let me leave full screen for a second. Here is a quick shot of what Atomic looks like. Um, Atomic is basically Red Hat reinventing how we do uh, Linux distributions. Um, we have, you know, of course we're famous for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. We also have uh, CentOS and Fedora that are available. Um, so we have atomic flavored releases of each of these distributions. You can get Red Hat Enterprise Linux, Atomic. You could get Atomic CentOS or Atomic Fedora as well. And what we do with each of those distributions is instead of shipping around 3,000 projects, we ship about our, our RPMs in, in a distribution. We strip it down to about 300 RPMs. This gives you, uh, and we include Docker, Kubernetes, um, Systemd, Journal D, all the essentials for building a really slim uh, cloud host. Uh, and pretty much everything that doesn't fit into that base image we're going to bring in via containers. And we've really gone all in with this strategy. Uh, we have, in fact, uh, OpenShift is actually running in a container, a privileged container, that manages your other containers. So um, Atomic is the, the basis for everything we do. Uh, Kubernetes will be, Kubernetes and Docker are going to be bundled by default uh, with Atomic. How many people here have heard of Kubernetes before? Not too many people. OK, we've got one, one out of this crowd. So Kubernetes is a project uh, started by Google. And um, what they have, what they're working on, is uh, basically a port of uh, some internal projects that Google has been working on. So internally, Google runs everything at scale. Uh, everything they do is all running in a container, or, or so I've heard. Uh, so they have a big management system to help them achieve this. And internally, it's a project called Google Borg, uh, kind of like the, the robots from uh, Star Trek, right? So this assimilates all of their workloads and helps manage everything at a Google-sized scale. Um, so what they've done with Kubernetes is they've taken these same management tactics um, and applied them to managing Docker containers. So this is what we use uh, at a fundamental level to uh, replicate Docker environments and to help control the life cycle of everything that's inside a container is mostly managed via Kubernetes. So you can find out more about Kubernetes uh, through the course of this talk and by checking out their, their uh, it's one of the few projects Google has on GitHub. So uh, great things to watch there. Red Hat's heavily involved in the upstream community in Kubernetes as well as in Docker, helping make those environments uh, secure and safe for multi-tenant uh, enterprise scale use. Um, my third on the list here is OpenShift. Uh, so OpenShift is a uh, project uh, that Red Hat initially required, uh, acquired a team that was working on uh, something called OpenShift a little more than three years ago. Um, and so Red Hat proper has been basically doing container-based hosting and management. Uh, these haven't been Docker containers in the past, but uh, for the last year, we've been working on Docker-based uh, hosting and scaling, and Kubernetes has become a key part of how we do that. And OpenShift adds a lot of nice things on top that you don't get out of the box with Kubernetes, and we'll see some of those features uh, coming up. And so everything else you need, 
you need a database, you need a Java runtime, you need a, a, a MongoDB, you, whatever you need, uh, you bring it in via a container. Um, and that's pretty much our whole stack, right? It, it either fits in a container or it's one of these first three. And, and OpenShift is actually in a container. So um, that's pretty much where we're headed. Um, here's a high level architectural overview of um, how operations teams, developers might interact with this environment. We start from the ground with our, our uh, infrastructure as a service. Um, from OpenShift's perspective, we really don't care where your infrastructure as a service comes from. It could be physical machines, it could be virtual machines, public cloud, private cloud, any of the above are all fair game when, when it comes to our platform layer. Uh, because we'll run on top of any infrastructure you could bring in. Um, we just like it to be running on top of a Project Atomic uh, style host. And part of the reason for that is because we want to secure these environments using SE Linux. Uh, that's the, kind of the default security model for, it, for securing uh, Dockerized environments and making sure that they don't, uh, uh, that malicious coders aren't able to compromise your host machines or the other containers. Um, so we'll see some more examples of this. We also have a integrated Docker registry that, uh, that's available, uh, persistent storage that's attachable. You might be using um, GlusterFS or one of the Red Hat storage projects uh, to attach storage to these uh, volumes. Uh, there's also a very nice routing layer. Um, the, there's a couple other pieces that are running on, on the master here. Uh, let me know if you have any specific questions about any of these pieces and we can dive into more detail. Um, either that or follow up with me after the talk. Any questions for now? I'll keep moving on and, and raise your, go ahead, feel free to raise your hand uh, throughout this talk and I'll fill in with more details. Um, okay, so if you are interested in containerizing your applications, your current workloads that you have today, there's a couple ways to do this. Um, one way is if you have a, a, a repo, you can add a Docker file to your repo. This is a very basic way of uh, starting to get, getting started with uh, building for Docker. Um, I know Docker Hub has a nice uh, automated builds uh, facility where if you have a public project or a private project, uh, you, can, you can pay for private access as well. Um, but they will automatically run builds on your Docker file in order to generate a Docker image. So this is one way that I, I generate Docker files. Um, but often you have something that's more complex than a single Docker image. You have a full microservices architecture with multiple containers that need to be scaled independently. Um, and so once you get to microservices, you're gonna wanna pay attention to what's available in the template landscape for Docker. Um, so one of the projects to keep an eye on is uh, Swarm. That's a, an official spec from the Docker community on how to do uh, composition of uh, containerized services. Um, another thing to look at is uh, Kubernetes templates and object lists. Uh, the nice thing about OpenShift, since we're running Kubernetes under the hood, anything that you package for Kubernetes in a Kubernetes template or object list will immediately be able to run on OpenShift by default. Uh, what we do with OpenShift templates is we take a Kubernetes template and we add a couple additional object types to the normal uh, lexicon of terms that you have access to. So we have a, a couple new things in our OpenShift templates and I'll get to some examples of, of what we've added um, next. Uh, another standard you can look to is uh, AppC. Um, and Red Hat also has something called the Nulecule new, new, new spec. Sorry, it's hard to say, uh, but really cool new stuff coming from the Red Hat developer program. If you're interested in signing up for the developer program here at Java One, we have a sign up station. Uh, I'd encourage you all uh, to check out developers.redhat.com and, and see our latest in uh, what we're doing with containers. Uh, so let's get started. I'll build and ship an image and we'll do a couple live demos here. Um, so I talked about doing automated builds on Docker Hub. That's one way to, to get started uh, with building. Uh, but let's do one step better. Let's show how you can quickly iterate on these images using OpenShift. 
So I'm going to start with a uh, smoke test project here. This is a project, I, uh, an example that we use. I copied this from my, uh, my whoops, let me try to fix the UI here. So this is a project, maybe as much as I can zoom. This is really hard to read. Um, I think this is what we're going to have to roll with. Uh, so here's a very hard to read project. Um, that's a basic uh, PHP uh, example. So here we could see the, it says, uh, I, I recently used this example at LinuxCon. So you could see my previous deployment has a basic hello world statement. I'm gonna take this project, build a new Docker image, and then we'll try iterating on this by setting up a webhook. Uh, so if I copy uh, the repo URL here, and I go back to my OpenShift environment, Here's an example of uh, the main main view uh, in OpenShift. You can see I have a list of projects that are available. This is one way that we help providing uh, multi-tenancy around your containerized services. Each of these projects can have different role-based access management assigned. You could have certain people that are in your deploy group or your release team. You could have other people that are developers or QA that can initiate builds. Um, so a lot of nice multi-tenancy we're adding around these projects um, that's kind of unique to uh, OpenShift deployment of Kubernetes. So I'll make a new project here for our uh, smoke test. And we'll test our source to image workflow, which is abbreviated S2I. Um, and I'll start off by adding a new repo here. So I'll start with our GitHub uh, repo. I'll hit the next button. This is a node. Uh, this is a PHP environment. So I'll take our PHP base for the lower layers of our Docker image. Um, one of the nice things about this, instead of doing a Docker build, if I were going to allow users to do a Docker build, um, within the lifecycle of that build. You have things like uh, if they're if you're building from a Docker file, you may have statements like a yum install or a apt get install. That means for the life cycle of that build, you're essentially trusting this developer with root access during the build phase, right? So what we do uh, is we have anything from the repo code down, we have available as a prepackaged Docker image that's maintained by the operations team. And then from there on up, we add additional layers to the Docker image for the repo code. That's why I chose a PHP 5 container that automatically has Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7 and PHP and Apache, everything I need to get started um, with a, a PHP environment. Um, I will go ahead and here we can choose whether this is a back end or a front end service. Since this is a front end service, I'm going to establish a route into this environment. Um, we also have a, uh, this section is called a deployment configuration. This is one of the new terms that uh, you will find in OpenShift, but not in Kubernetes. So here's one of the differentiators we have. Um, this deployment configuration says, anytime we build a new application container, we would like to auto-deploy it based on the following policies. So I would like to auto-deploy any time a new image is available, or I can auto-deploy any time uh, we add a new, key, a new key and value into the environment here. Um, so this could be my authentication to access my, my database or, or some other credentials that I would like to stuff into the application. But the idea is you don't want to add this, any kind of state internal to the container. So we'll track it separately outside the container and then make sure it gets injected into each containerized environment as we scale that environment up. Uh, the next section here is a build config. Uh, so you can see I'm starting from a particular source repo and we have some options here. I can configure a webhook to automatically initiate new builds of my Docker container anytime I modify the repo code or operations teams, if they had a low-level exploit to something like OpenSSL, something that's kind of out of the reach and out of the scope of, of a normal patch cycle or development cycle for, for developers, right? You want to patch the, the fundamental base system image, 
this gives operations teams a way to automatically rebuild the application containers anytime the base layers are modified in order to release a patch or something like that. And then of course, depending if this is a dev environment or a production environment, I'm probably going to want to leave this checkbox selected for dev and QA, maybe not for production unless I really trust my whole build pipeline and, and testing suite, right? Uh, so I'll leave the auto deploy check so we can see some of this um, uh, automatic build in action. We also have a, a way to add more replicas. I'm going to leave this at, at one. I'll start it with two. And we'll see, you can initially start with two containers. So here I've got a, um, a confirmation that my environments were requested. Um, I already have a routable URL for this service, but there aren't any containers that have been built yet. So if I click on this link, we'll end up with a uh, 500 error because we don't have any way for the load balancers to pass the traffic on to our containers. Uh, so let's take a look and see if we can start a build here. I'll go over to uh, browse. Let me see if I can browse for builds. I'll click on the start build button and we'll, we'll run a build here. And uh, while this is running, I'm going to go back to the GitHub project and I'm going to set up our webhook URL. So here's the URL for our webhook. I could also trigger this from the command line using curl, or if I had a Jenkins or another uh, CI system, I could trigger builds from another system just using curl. Uh, so I'll go back to my incomprehensible uh, GitHub page here and try to find a way to configure webhooks in here. Here's my webhook section. Looks like I already have one that I will get rid of. get my login here and we will add a new webhook sorry about the display here this is best I got uh, webhooks that is not it there is a hidden button somewhere on this page that I can't seem to reach bummer um, Uh, let me see if I can fire up a, another browser to help me out here. See if this one works. Uh, I'm really not sure where the... Here we go. Sorry about this. Let's see if I can get back to GitHub. And we'll set up this deploy hook really quick. OK, much better, but I'm not logged in. Sorry for the delay on this. This is pretty impressive once I get to it. Uh, thanks for your patience. Let me get this OAuth token and we'll be right on our way. Okay, here we go. Looks much nicer. I should use this other browser, I guess. Okay, add webhook. Here we go. Here's the payload URL. Um, and I'm using self-signed certificates, so here I'll just push the whole thing. All right, so this should give me a way to really quickly make changes here and visualize it and, and see the results on our application over here. Let's reload this and see. Okay, so here's my, my current message that I stored in the index.html. This is our deployed PHP container, and I'll go make a change here on GitHub and we'll see it automatically trigger a new build in OpenShift, build a new Docker container, we'll store that in our internal registry and then deploy this out to our cluster. And we should be able to see, uh, here I'll go and make a quick edit. 
So let's change this, of course, to thanks for attending Java 1 2015. Sound good with everyone? All right. Uh, so like a good developer, I will add a quick uh, add a quick commit message. And uh, like a bad developer, I'm going to commit directly to the master branch. Oh, well. Quick, quick demo. That's, that's all you guys get. OK, thanks for attending Java 1. Let's go back to our web interface. We'll see if a new build is running. I'll go to the smoke test project. It looks like, here we go, new build just triggered from the webhook from GitHub. And currently, we have thanks for attending LinuxCon. And we should see right here, we've got two containers that are currently up and running. As soon as this build finished, finishes, we should see a deployment automatically trigger. And then we'll see it scale out uh, up to two, which was our requested allocation. So the build's still running. I could also watch the logs while this build is in progress. That's another thing we can do. Um, let me go check and see from the build tab if there's any more information. Overview. These usually take about 30 seconds, so I was hoping it'd be done by now. Let me go see if I got more information. Here's our smoke test. Oh, this is running containers. Let me go through to browse builds. Here we go. Yeah, most of these have completed in just a short amount of time. Let me see if we have the updated page yet. No, nope. something, something amiss with our environment here. So I could check the build logs and figure out exactly what's failing. Uh, you saw most of the pipeline work as far as being able to quickly set up a webhook, being able to generate a new Docker container, and then hopefully automatically store that Docker container in our environment. Aha, OK, not sure what took so long, but hopefully this is done with our, our correct uh, build. Let's find, out, um, let's find out where we're at as far as deployments. Here we're pulling the new Docker image from our internal Docker registry and distribute it, distributing it to the node machines. Uh, fingers crossed. Uh, wish me luck on this. Here we go. Thanks for attending Java 1. So you can see we started right with a GitHub repo, built a Docker image, and then iterated on that Docker image and showed how you could set up a whole continuous delivery pipeline, uh, basically. Um, let's see. I've got one more quick demo for you guys. Uh, this one has uh, audience interaction and, and prizes, potentially. So hopefully this is uh, entertaining for you. Um, if you stick around, we're going to be giving out a Raspberry Pi. Uh, and here we go. So this is a, a project I made for uh, me and a couple other people at Red Hat worked on this. Uh, this is a custom UI for visualizing the container statuses as we scale up. Um, so let's take a look at our current hex board. Um, this is what I call the hex board here. And we have different statuses that we'll report. Uh, these are statuses coming from the Kubernetes API. So we directly expose uh, Docker access points. Like if you were running Docker locally, you could do Docker exec against a local container. We allow you to use our command line tool, OC, in order to do OC exec against remote containers. This allows you to talk to your containers throughout your cloud um, as if they were local. Um, we also have uh, a lot of other great uh, API endpoints directly from Kubernetes that are available. And so that's one of the ways I get the data for this, for this visualization is hooking up to a streaming API endpoint from Kubernetes in order to monitor these container statuses. So right now it's reporting empty because we haven't requested any scale up of this environment. So I'm going to add a new backend uh, data store here. I'll also get this project from GitHub, github.com, Ryan J, Sketchpod. So you'll all be, if you play along, you'll be drawing a sketch with your cell phone and submitting it, and you'll see it appear up on the hex board. So this is a Node.js project. 
I'm going to choose the Node.js base image. Uh, we've already talked about routing. This is a back-end service, so I don't need to establish a route for this particular. We'll actually be using the hex board as a proxy to access our back-end data store, which will hold the, the sketch that you'll submit. Um, the data store is kind of a, a it'll hold one image. It's not really a, a, an advanced data store, um, just for demo purposes. We already discussed the deployment configuration, so I'll automatically deploy as soon as our build completes. Um, our build configuration, I'm not going to need the webhook trigger, but I'll leave it selected anyway. Um, scaling, we'll start with one. And I can also add a, a Kubernetes label if I wanted to have an easy way to do a cleanup later. Uh, I can delete all the sketch pods without deleting the hex board by adding this label. The label selectors are a nice way of, if you had a lot of, uh, like, let's say, a database running in a container and you wanted to make sure it always landed on your machines with tons of memory or tons of disk, you could use these label selectors to place your workloads on the correct hardware in your, across your uh, cluster. So let's see, I'm going to go back to the hex board. Looks like we don't have a container yet. Um, that's because our build has not run yet. I'll go and start a build. We'll start a build for our sketch pod, and, and then we'll scale it up to, to populate this hex board. And then you'll be able to submit a sketch with your cell phone and, and see it uh, stream into this interface. to do uh, OC, I'm going to switch to the project scope of Hexboard in order to show you uh, some of the activity, what's happening there. Um, I got a duplicate build here. Let me delete uh, my second build. We have a build, we had a, we had a bug that's already been fixed in the upstream code. I'm just running some slightly older code. The builds will automatically kick in, and here I'm pressing the button. So that's why we have a, a second build that appeared. So here we're running our build, just like we showed before. When this build is done, we should automatically get a new deployment and um, a new container for our hex, for our hex board. Uh, since I'm logged in, I can do OC build logs of sketchpod1, and here's the build as it's happening. So it looks like the build is completed, and we're pushing the resulting Docker image into our internal registry at this point. Looks like the push has succeeded, so now we should be very quickly deploying automatically. The deploy showed up, and now we're pulling that image from our internal registry, placing it onto one of the node machines. And we should see here, we have one container that's gone through the whole life cycle, all the way up to up and running. So we start off with an empty status, then we go to an awaiting state, then a pending. Pending is, uh, awaiting is basically saying, the request has been received, but we haven't acted on it yet. Pending is, we're actually s servicing the request. Next, we'll be running, booting up the environment, um, Let's see, let me scale this up. OC scale, RC sketch pod, and I'll set the replicas to 63. Oops. Oh, this is our first deployment, so it's going to be sketch pod one. We have a, in OpenShift, we have a one to one relationship between deployments and replication controllers. Replication controller is a term from Kubernetes. Um, oh. So we're all the way up to fully, we've requested the full allocation, and here the containers are booting up, and then lastly we do a HTTP request into the container to verify that it's up. So here we're up at full capacity. Um, and I can also do something like uh, get pods, 
If I had the uh, Kubernetes command line tool, I could also run uh, kube control get pods. We actually just passed through to the Kubernetes command line. So here's a list of uh, containers. I could also do OC delete pod on, uh, let's say, two of these. And we'll intentionally cause some damage. What if two of our web servers suddenly failed? What would happen in this environment? So I'll delete two. And here we could see immediately, we recognize that we requested 63, but our count has dropped down by two. Immediately, we go to work on repairing our hex board and getting us back up to full capacity. Uh, I have another example here um, where what, what if we had, what this one does is gets a list of pods, grabs 10 of them, and then deletes 10. This is to simulate what if we had a whole node that fell, that went offline, right? Even a larger scale failure, uh, I guess this was five, got deleted. Let's see what happens with a little bit larger size failure. Really quickly, um, even without being aware of the infrastructure as a service, we can reallocate containers onto available nodes. Anytime we detect that the container count has dropped below our specified requested amount. Uh, so really quickly, we're back up at full capacity. Um, let me get back to my, find my slide deck here. I think it is at bit.ly. Uh, intro. Jeez, let me find this. Here, this is what I wanted. All right. So, oh, not what I wanted to paste. Copy. Okay. All right. Back to the slides. So, building and shipping. We talked about source to image. I showed webhooks. We, did, uh, we didn't do a git push, but we did basically the same, modifying code right on GitHub. We covered some of this uh, scale up and replication, recovery. Um, if you want a high level, uh, kind of let's all agree on the same terminology. I know that's, that's a big thing with containers is some people are reusing these terms that you may have heard from in other, in other scopes and they don't quite mean the same thing. Here's a nice glossary of terms you guys can refer to. I have all these notes online and you can take these slides to go if you'd like. Um, so here's a couple terms. Uh, feel free to ask me specifics about any of these. Most of them are Kubernetes terms, and the ones we're adding are deployment config and build config are the new features, major features that are added in OpenShift. Uh, we also have templates as an easy way to package up your entire stack and make it easy to reproduce that whole complete stack in different clusters. Um, Here's a nice high level overview of how a lot of these pieces might fit together. These pieces that are in light blue here, replication controller, pods, persistent volumes and services, these are all provided by Kubernetes. Everything in orange is, are, are objects that Red Hat and the OpenShift team are adding uh, to help do additional automation on top of Kubernetes. Any questions about this slide? No, feel free to ask later and, and, and uh, so I already did part of the hex board demo. Uh, if you'd like to interact now, here's your opportunity. You can go to this URL with your mobile phone or laptop. Any volunteers here? Some folks have a mobile phone, I'm sure. Uh, no, all right, so anyone with a cell phone, please help me out with this next piece um, and I'll have a, a bonus prize for you as well. Um, so bit.ly slash java1 hyphen openshift hyphen demo. Um, and that will go, that will lead you right to this hex board. I'll show just a minute longer. Bitly Java 1 OpenShift demo. Cool, so that should give you the hex board. You can watch the whole thing from the hex board. You can also, now that you're on this URL, this long ugly URL, you can add slash mobile in order to get to the mobile interface. So I'll walk through the, the demo here on my system. You could do the same thing with your cell phone. Step one, uh, you'll enter your name. 
So I'm Ryan J. I'll go to the next page. It's not super clear what's happening here, but if, with your cell phone, you ought to be able to draw with your finger. So I'm going to attempt very carefully to draw. Oh, this is bad. Oh, man. It was going to be a red hat, but now I, I have a, a hat with a bow on top somehow. OK. This, if you can draw a really nice red hat, please give it your best shot. I'm going to deploy this to my container. I should have a link here where I can see kind of a receipt. Uh, what this shows me is internally, I'm proxying to this direct IP behind the scenes. My container environment now is holding a copy of the image. My backend has a copy of the image, and it's stashing it at that address. Um, and if I go to the main demo URL, I should be able to see. We've got already a nice couple. Here's my uh, hat with a bow on top. Uh, we got a couple other. This is like a looks like a pretty good hat here. Um, I think I'm going to give you guys a little bit more time. You could watch your image as it gets deployed into a container. We'll visualize it. This is a nice hat. I'm going to pick a couple winners here. Whoops. Click through to the uh, to the receipt. Back it up a page. Okay. Ugh. All right, that's that's a good one. All right, I'm gonna pick a couple winners. Okay. Ah. All right. Man, my, my keyboard's not working. I'm going to just declare everyone who's on the board is a winner based on my demo uh, difficulties here. I really can't click on, uh, can't seem to click on the right uh, keys. All right, so if you're up on the board, let me know. I've got some USB sticks for each of you who helped uh, play along. Um, I'm going to wrap up this presentation and we will raffle off our prize. Uh, Java 1, OpenShift demo. That's not it. Okay. Where did my slides go? Here we go. Is that copying? Can't tell what's happening here. Job. Damn it. Ah, OK. Bitly, thanks for your patience, by the way. Sorry about this. Uh, OpenShift Java 1. This is the uh, slides, slide URL, if you'd like any of these notes to take home. Um, we also have, for everyone who played along, or if you didn't play along, um, we have a free ebook on Kubernetes. Uh, follow this URL, bit.ly, Java1K8S. That's the abbreviation for Kubernetes. Java1K8's book. This link is in the slides. so. Either way, either take down the slides or take down this URL directly, and um, you'll get a free copy of the Kubernetes uh, ebook, which looks a bit like this here. One last look Bitly, Java 1, K8S book. Cool. So. Just to wrap things up, we've got a couple great additional topics that you guys, if you want to know about advanced deployments, rolling deployments, blue-green deployments, A-B deployments, there's ways to customize your deployment config in order to make the deployment process easy to configure, make it repeatable uh, for developers or for anyone uh, who'd like to set up their own deployment workflow. Um, if you want to know about build and release automation. We've got a couple great links for you here as well. Uh, since this is a Java audience, I would definitely recommend 
checking out this link on binary deployments. This is how we will take an existing war or ear file, wrap that in a Docker container for you, and package it up, make it easy to ship as a Docker image. Even though you already have portability on the JB JVM, this gives you some additional isolation for your Java processes and nice uh, role-based access control and uh, granular kind of enterprise quality uh, management of these containerized services. And the same service uh, infrastructure for all, not, not only your Java projects, but anything that runs on Linux. Any LAMP stack, uh, Node.js, really anything you, you like, you can deploy with this uh, stack. Um, we have links about Jenkins integration. If you wanted to do a, a MongoDB replication, we have some examples of that. We have examples of uh, master-slave uh, database structures using Postgres. Um, there's some nice uh, notes on monitoring. I've got my um, hex board example in here. If, if you'd like to see how I did my DIY monitoring by just reading uh, messages off the Kubernetes API. Um, lots of great follow-up topics. If you're interested in setting up your own OpenShift environment, um, we have, here's a lot of great more, more training, um, but you can also grab releases right off of GitHub. If you go to GitHub OpenShift slash origin and then click on the releases tab, we have our upstream releases are all available on GitHub. Um, we also have an all-in-one VM that's available. Um, I'd be happy to help you set up this VM environment. Um, basically, we use Vagrant and VirtualBox so you can basically, if you already have Vagrant and Vir VirtualBox, it's just running Vagrant up and you're ready with an entire OpenShift cluster ready to go on your laptop. Uh, so you could show it to your coworkers and convince them this is the solution that you all need to be collaborating on in, in the future. Uh, let's see. We also use Ansible to deploy our clusters. That's how I set up the environment that I was working on today. We, I used an Ansible script to deploy to Amazon. Um, this is a, the exact command that I ran to kick off the Ansible playbook when I set up a, a classroom environment for LinuxCon. Uh, so I re recycled some of my slides here. This is actually yesterday's playbook, not today's. But uh, so, of course, the default password of LinuxCon EU no longer applies. This is, I've deleted this environment. But you should be able to use this same command with Ansible in order to spin up your own OpenShift cluster. Uh, that's about it from me. I think we'll do the raffle next. And here's that last chance to get a link to these slides uh, if you want any of this information as a take home example. Um, thanks for attending. Feel free to follow up with me over in the booth if you have any follow up specific questions. And I'll turn it over to our raffle committee and, and uh, hopefully one of you guys, uh, good luck on winning the Raspberry Pi.